morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the California Alternative Energy and Advanced Transportation Financing Authority Small Business Financing Workshop. Thank you all for attending. Um, my name is Jonathan Verhoof. I'm the specialist uh, working on our, our non-residential financing program. And uh, just a few logistics. Um, everyone's uh, in mute, but uh, if you would like to uh, have a question or comment, you can uh, raise your hand in the, uh, in the webinar interface. And you can also type into the chat box. And we're going to allow for some time for a question and answers uh, with each section. And there's also going to be a block of time for Q&A at the end of the session. And we're also going to be sending out a follow-up survey uh, after the webinar, so people can also weigh in uh, that way. And uh, just a note, our deck has a, a few slides in a different order than the one that's posted. But the, the, uh, the slide deck that we're using is posted uh, on our website as a reference. And uh, we're not going to be going through every slide in detail because there's a lot of information here, but uh, we're going to be uh, going through the slide deck so you can follow along if you like. Closed captioning is available for this meeting at the, uh, at the following URL, as you can see there mywebex.com, and it's also available through the uh, meeting invitation. Uh, there, uh, there's a link to closed captioning as well. Is, uh, is the thing going to be recorded at all? Um, yes, we're, we're making a recording of this meeting. Cool. Mm -hmm. I don't have Okay, so I just wanted to uh, run through the workshop agenda briefly. Um, the executive summary, we're going to go over some core concepts. Uh, in the introductory section, uh, we're going to talk about the background of uh, our pilots, the California Hub for Energy Efficiency Financing, and where we are so far. Then in our program structure, we're going to be getting into more detail on our proposal, having your feedback. On, uh, we're going to talk about how to engage with our program, what kind of projects are covered, and how the financing works. And then we're going to be getting into the participation section, um, how the various players interact. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have a feedback section for any questions you might have. And the goals for our workshop. Um, we're going to be providing you with a detailed view into your approach, um, where we are and what we're planning, and uh, then we'd like to hear from you and then get your feedback on our program. Okay, good morning, everybody. This is Miriam Jaffe Block. I'm the program manager with CAPSA and the Chief. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. I just want to also note we've got a room full of uh, people here in, um, in Sacramento, and we've got about um, 75 people on the line. So we will do our best to incorporate your comments and questions as we go. Um, I'm going to start with just a couple of brief summaries about the pilot. So this small business program is a private capital program. We are trying to leverage private capital to support loans, leases, and energy service agreements for nonprofits and small business customers. And this pilot features a credit enhancement in the form of a low loss reserve, as well as a statewide marketing campaign. So the concept here is that we can take a small amount of rate payer dollars and use them as a credit enhancement to leverage private capital and to allow financing companies to offer either more attractive terms or broader underwriting criteria than they normally would to accept a wider range of applicants. This in turn allows contractors to sell more projects or to sell deeper retrofits and higher efficient equipment that can be more expensive and then allows customers to access that capital and that savings and then the state of California saves so we all win. So obviously finance companies and contractors and ESCOs have a lot to gain from this program. We also want to call um, uh, attention to utility program implementers, our hope is that you will be able to integrate our financing into your program and be able to meet your savings goals for the utilities with less direct rebate and incentive costs. 
um, because you can use financing to help customers achieve savings instead of paying out a cash rebate. And for local governments who might be on the line, we hope that um, you will see our financing as program as a way to help you meet your local sustainability goals. And so what we're going to do now, actually, we are, we're going to find out who is here with us on the line, and then we'll, um, we'll figure out who's here in person. So I'm going to launch a couple of polls. So um, if the first one is, if you can describe your um, organization in one of these five ways, and if you're an other, don't worry, we have another poll for you um, that's coming next. And in terms of in the room, I know we've got a few governments. We've got an imp private contractor, private contractor, financing, energy commission. Energy commission. Okay, so in the room we've, and government. Okay, we've got a good mix. Um, okay, so I'm going to close the poll and share the poll. And so, um, okay, so I just this in a way that folks can. Okay, so I'll just read it out loud for the folks in the room. So we've got about 30% um, um, energy service companies or contractors, about 30% other, about a third program implementers, and a handful of finance companies. Okay, so now if you answered other, then um, please tell us um, who you are. It will take just about another 15 seconds for folks to identify. Okay, so I'm going to close this poll and share it. And so um, we've got about, okay, so about 36% consultants, and then we've got about a fifth, manufacturers, distributors, utility company reps, and government entity reps. Okay, thank you very much. And then finally, I'm curious to know how familiar you are with the chief pilot. So if you can tell us if you're very familiar, somewhat a new, and maybe folks in the room, if you're very familiar, raise your hand. Somewhat familiar <laughs> and very new. Okay, thank you, that helps me. Okay, so I'm gonna close this poll and we're gonna share so we've got over half of folks here are new to Chief. Okay, so that means I am going to go through a little bit of background. Um, and actually, the background might be new to you, even if you're uh, familiar. Okay, so um, we all know that the state of California legislature has set very ambitious climate change goals for building energy reduction. And given the amount of retrofits that are needed out there to bring existing buildings just up to code, let alone beyond code, um, there's no way we will be able to meet these goals relying on, on public funds or ratepayer funds. We must engage private capital. And that's the point of the pilot. So that is why the Public Utility Commission has authorized the um, pilot programs and has set $75 million towards them. I want to talk a little bit about the partners involved. So CAFA, um, the California Alternative Energy and Advanced Transportation Financing Authority, um, is where uh, Jonathan and I work. We are housed in the state treasurer's office, and we run programs to leverage private capital to support the state's policy goals, particularly around energy and environmental policy. And we administer the CHIEF, which is the California Hub for Energy Efficiency, which was the hub that was conceived of by the Public Utility Commission when they authorized these pilots. We are developing the pilots in partnership with the four investor-owned utilities in California. And the pilots also have a marketing implementer, which is important for that deal flow generation, which we need. And right now, that is the Center for Sustainable Energy. So our first uh, pilot launched in the summer of 2016, which is the residential, uh, single-family residential pilot. And I wanted to share a little bit of stats and highlights because we've had some really good growth particularly as we have made some modifications. And I'm going to talk about the types of modifications that we want to make to the commercial pilot um, and the sort of redesign in a few minutes. So we've, we've, we actually, since I wrote this slide, we've crossed the 2.8 million mark in residential loans, which is a small start, but it's great growth for us um, in our early stage. 
We have more than 200 participating contractors. We've just enrolled two new lenders in the last uh, couple of weeks. So small business, so small business owners have some real barriers to energy efficiency. Uh, number one, they have scarce capital and they don't necessarily find it that lucrative to invest their scarce capital in energy efficiency when they can invest it in new employees or a new product line. Um, and they also have scarce time, so they are not able to research complex financing options and put a lot of time into it. So we want our program to help take away that first cost investment barrier and help them access capital in a very simple and easy way. Another component of our pilot is the uh, statewide marketing campaign and a new uh, public facing platform called Go Green Financing has just launched. Right now, it's only, um, its content is really consumer facing for the consumers that might take out one of these residential energy efficiency loans, just launched on April 13th. And the contractor and uh, partner site will launch um, in June. And then once the small business is up and running, then contractors and finance companies participating in our program will be featured on the site so that customers who are driven to this website through the utilities marketing can find you. We really want to design the chief small business pilot to fill a niche that is not being filled by on-bill financing and commercial PACE. So both OBS and CPACE offer great options for small businesses, but we think there are projects that our program will serve that OBS and CPACE don't serve. For example, there are customers who want to do projects that are going to have a payback longer than what the utilities require, or whose projects will never be bill neutral. Um, there are also more than half of all small business owners rent their space, so CPACE is not an option for them, and we think we can serve tenant occupants. So some of you attended a workshop or workshops in 2016 where we talked about the design of the commercial pilot, and you might be wondering why we're, what we've been doing since then and why we're back now with another workshop. And so I want to talk about that for a minute. So um, back in late 2016, CAFA started a process of asking the, the Public Utility Commission for the authority to make some modifications to the pilot so that they would be more broadly relevant to the market as well as um, more simple and streamlined for stakeholders to use. And in March of 2017, the, um, the CPUC issued a decision granting CAFA broad authority over the direction of the pilot. So what we did was we made two rounds of regulatory modifications to our residential pilot, and we've seen a lot of growth since we made those changes. And then we spent the last six months developing a commercial financing pilot that we thought would accommodate the various needs of the commercial energy efficiency market. And that's what we want to show you today, and that's what we want your feedback on both today and you know, following today and additional conversations. I also want to talk a little bit about our philosophy with the pilot design. We are, um, we are seeking to enable broad uptake and broad market participation. We are accepting that not every project that is financed through our program will have energy savings in the way that the CPUC counts and measures them. And we are okay with that because we are taking a portfolio approach and we believe that on a portfolio level we have savings and that it's more important that we um, reach many people and have brought uptake to actually get savings than to keep the pilot very small and narrow focused because the criteria is too stringent. We believe that Decision 17.326 gave us authority to do this. We're testing a pilot. It's a pilot, so we want to test a lot of approaches. And um, we also are not extensing ratepayer dollars the same way as a traditional utility rebate or incentive program does. We are using ratepayer dollars to leverage third-party capital, which we believe is very different, and so we don't think we need all of the rigor and strictness that you would find in a project where somebody receives a $20,000 payout from a utility. Um, I also want to note that savings for these pilots um, will be uh, determined by the energy measurement and verification team that the CPUC contracts with through, through a round of contracting that they're currently undergoing. And CAFA has been advocating for a meter-based uh, savings approach to remove the need for complex data collection up front. So uh, this next slide shows our timeline. We will be drafting regulations this spring. We will have another regulatory workshop this summer to present you the actual regulations for comments. 
and then we will have redrafting after your comments um, with a launch in 2018. Okay, thank you, Miriam. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, some of the key concepts of the program. This slide. Give me late so I can catch your name. Oh, my name is Jonathan. Okay, hi there. So this slide illustrates on a high level um, financing eligibility and how the credit enhancement works. Um, for the small business pilot, we're proposing a maximum finance amount of up to 2.5 million. That's that second line there. And if you look at the line beneath that, claim eligible finance about up to 1 million. That means up to 1 million of any project may receive uh, the credit enhancement. And then within that amount that's being credit enhanced, you can see there's two subcategories. 70% or more must be used for energy saving measures and related installations. And I'll talk a little bit more about related installations uh, on the next slide. And then up to 30% may be used for non-energy improvements. So this is intended to be a uh, selling point for the program as well. And then uh, the remaining uh, portion of the project would be the claim ineligible finance amount measures that are not eligible for the credit enhancement. And this slide goes into more detail of how uh, this all breaks down. So on the left, underneath uh, at least 70%, you can see um, that we've got energy savings measures and demand response. So that's the goal of the program in order to uh, reduce energy consumption. And within the um, program, we've got different ways that those can qualify. Those are the three subcategories on the bottom left, and I'll be going into more detail on those later. Then there's, as I mentioned, related installations. So included within the um, energy savings measures and demand response, there are legal and practical requirements uh, for the project completion. So you put in a new HVAC, you need to repair the drywall, that's included as part of an energy saving measure or you needed permits, you needed some safety measure that was required by law, that's also included within that 70%. And then uh, within 30% are non-energy improvements that you can use the rest of that financing for other improvements within your uh, building. So you can work on landscaping, new floors, remodeling. And then over on the right, on the bottom right, you can see within claim and eligible finance amount, um, you're allowed to have additional non-energy installations over 30% of the cost or additional energy saving measures beyond that credit enhanced amount or potentially credit enhanced amount of one million. And that's also where we're allowing a distributed generation. So solar combined heated power and storage. And this slide illustrates our proposed tiers. These tiers are going to inform how the uh, how the program rules are applied as well as uh, we're looking at uh, having different levels of uh, credit enhancements. Um, which is again, it's, it's proposed, we're still looking on uh, determining what level of credit enhancement uh, to, to apply. But um, the most important uh, tier there is uh, over 350,000, that's going to have uh, a different method of qualification that I'll talk about uh, a little bit later. <clears throat> so um, I wanted to run uh, a poll here to see uh, what kind of project sizes people are typically uh, looking at in the, the portion of the industry. So I'll give everyone a few seconds to weigh in on that poll here and then... Uh, and this first poll is for the, on the contractor side, if you can let us know what your um, average project size is. About 100 Oh, okay. Okay, okay so the two in the room, we've got about 100,000. What would an example of a 100K project be? Oh, we provide commercial uh, LED lighting. So if they go in, they've probably got 150,000 square feet. Something like that. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for weighing in. Um, so the, for the results of the poll, we've got uh, about 14% at under 50,000, 60% at 50 to 350,000, and 26% over 350,000. Great. So then we'd like to run that second poll here. This is for the uh, finance companies. How about for? Um, I would assume uh, 50 to 150. Okay. It's definitely, it's definitely not under 50. Okay. So. Um, 
in the room we had 50 to 150, and uh, on the line we've got a 20% at under 50,000, 50% 50 at 50,000 to 350,000, and 30% over 350,000. So um, at this point, we have time to take uh, a few questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and see if anyone has raised their hand in the room. Do we have any questions on this structure, so key concepts so far in the room? Okay, I have a question. Um, just so I understand, credit enhancement is essentially the The question is, is the credit enhancement, I'm just going to repeat the question sure. for the because the microphone doesn't carry. The question is, is the credit enhancement a loan loss reserve? And yes, in this particular program, we are designing the credit enhancement as a loan loss reserve. Um, Jonathan, we have a question. Um, okay, so we have a question that I'm going to read. Okay. Um, how does this program support or compete with implementing the IOU requirement to offload much of their EE programs to third-party administrators once their business plans are approved by the CPUC? And um, so um, we don't want to compete with something that's already happening. What we hope is that the program will complement those efforts and that perhaps we can be the financing arm of those uh, third-party projects. Um, and that's what we want to hear from folks who are going to um, bid on the utilities um, administration as to whether or not what we're proposing would work for their program. I'm going to uh, turn to a couple of questions about what Jonathan just went over, and then we'll try to answer some others as we go on. So um, let's see. I have a question here. What does claim eligible mean? So I'm going to go back, Jonathan, to that okay. slide. So claim eligible means that if there is a default, the um, finance company can um, submit a claim with us, and we will pay out of the loan loss reserve up to that amount. So and we'll actually reimburse at 90% because we want the finance company to have some skin in the game. So claim eligible up to a million means uh, up to a million dollars of the project can be claim el eligible, which actually means 900,000. It means that your finance project could be $2 million, but we will give you a credit enhancement on the first million of it. And then if there is a default we will um, reimburse you. We will consider that one million, whatever portion of that one million, we'll consider that claim eligible. Um, okay, let's keep going, and yeah. I'll address some. I'll group some of these questions together as we move on. All right. So now we'd like to talk a little bit about contractor eligibility and roles. So the contractor plays a key role in, in the project, and we're envisioning that a lot of these projects are going to be contractor-driven. So as you can see in the diagram here, the contractor is going to be providing the, the finance company with a scope of work, as well as a cost breakdown of energy saving versus non-energy saving measures, which references that 70 and 30 uh, breakdown that I was talking about earlier. And then the customer is going to be getting a uh, scope of work as well as a bill impact estimate. And a side note, we're going to be providing a sample version of the bill impact estimate, so you don't have to draft, draft your own. And then uh, we'll be getting from the contractor uh, proof of eligibility as well as project certification from the contractor. And uh, for con contractor participation criteria, we've got an active California contractor's license. No disciplinary action by the CSLB within the past 12 months. Um, we're proposing at least $2 million in general liability insurance. And uh, we've got a participation agreement so that you're going to abide by the program rules. And at this point, I'd like to engage in a little bit of Q&A. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with question two here. Uh, we're trying to get a sense of the role of project developer in the industry, which is to say um, uh, people who are driving projects that are actually not uh, Using their uh, having a California contractor's license. So I'd like to know from folks how common is it in the industry that that is actually taking place? And anyone in the room is welcome to weigh in as well. It's not that common, you think? Oh, for us, it's not. Okay, okay, got you. And if folks on the line want to comment on this, these uh, developer questions, if you want to ra uh, raise your hand, we will unmute your line. Okay, I see that some folks say it's not common, but very common on the lighting side. That's interesting. Okay. 
So in that regard, um, if in the case of a, a project developer, would they uh, normally work with a firm that has a California contractor's license in-house? And related to that, are there many project developers who do not have their uh, their own California contractor's license? Question number four. Are you raising their hand? No hands raised. Okay, it looks like distributors work with uh, contractors to develop projects. Great, thank you very much, folks, for weighing in. Okay. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about project and measure eligibility. This is referenced on the previous slides. So we're proposing three different pathways for energy savings measures to qualify for the program. Um, the first, <clears throat> okay, so first I want to give some definitions. Energy savings measure is energy, any energy efficiency or demand response measure, including alterations and improvements that are required. And uh, energy efficiency is an energy using appliance, equipment, control system, or practice whose installation or implementation results in reduced grid supply energy use. Whereas demand response are, are reduction, increases, or shifts in electricity consumption by customers in response to economic or reliability signals. So um, the three measures, or the three uh, ways that uh, measures can be qualified. First, we have a pre-qualified list. And that's included as a, um, an appendix in this um, slide deck. And the list is intended to have broad categories, which are capturing the most commonly used um, uh, type of measures in the commercial and non-residential space. A second method of qualification is if you've gone through the utility custom approval process, then you're qualified for uh, financing through the program. And then the third is, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this on other slides, but certified measures by a certified energy uh, manager or professional engineer. So this is our first pathway, the uh, pre-qualified measure list. So examples include rooftop contr unit controls, uh, VFDs, LED lighting, insulation, heat pumps. And uh, projects up to $350,000 can use the uh, this measure, uh, pre-qualified measure list. <clears throat> and uh, up to $2.5 million for lighting projects, of which only the first million will be claim eligible for financing. And also we include uh, utility deemed rebate other as a category, so if you receive a utility rebate and we haven't captured it on the list, you can still qualify with this method. I'll come back to those questions in a little bit. So method two, as I've said, if you're already uh, gone through the utility custom approval process, then you're qualified. So that's uh, any measure already approved by utilities as well as uh, REN or CCA custom programs. And we're, all we're going to need is that you're going to need a copy of your uh, utility custom approval uh, notification. And the third method uh, we put together because we've gotten a lot of external uh, feedback that uh, the utility custom process takes a long time. So um, customers in the, in, the, in the real world are likely to install a less efficient measure rather than wait on that custom measure uh, getting approved through the process. So what we're exploring here is a faster process by which someone can install custom uh, measures that are not on our list. And the two uh, professionals that we're looking at here are professional engineers licensed in California and certified energy managers uh, who are certified by the Association of Energy Engineers. And when, when they're submitting uh, their certification, they're also going to be providing us with an energy savings estimate for the project. Okay. Um, and I want to go over contractor requirements. Uh, Contractor project requirements, you need to you know, hold a license that's applicable to the work being performed and ensure that uh, ESM fuel savings, either electric or gas, match the utility service type. So, for example, if you're getting electrical service from a municipal uh, like SMUD or LADWP, then a lighting measure won't qualify. You would want to use it, it would be for a gas measure in that circumstance. And as I mentioned, uh, a real impact estimate is required so the customer knows what kind of savings they're looking at, but we're going to provide an example version of that. And then all measures need to be uh, Title 24 compliant. And as mentioned on a previous slide, non-energy related improvements can comprise up to 30% of the claim eligible finance amount. Okay. 
<clears throat> and on the back end, we're going to be uh, subjecting projects to post-installation verifications and checks. So a portion of the projects will get documentation checks. We're going to be checking that the project is a utility customer. Um, we're going to be checking any claimed rebates. We're going to make sure that the fuel source matches. Um, we're going to be looking at the cost breakdown between energy and non-energy measures and checking the invoice. And then a subset of those that are getting the check, we're going to be having the on-site verification where we're just going to check the equipment type and quantity as well as um, verify installation. So now we've got time for a little bit more Q&A. I want to go back to the previous question here. <clears throat> so we'd like to uh, hear from folks. Uh, have you all, uh, do you all think that the uh, energy savings measures list will be useful as it's currently proposed in its current form? Um, and are we missing any important measures on the draft list? <clears throat> as well as uh, there are specs for some of the uh, measures on the list, and we want to know if those uh, specs are reasonable requirements. We've got a lot of questions coming in that we are trying to answer, but um, I don't see any hands raised. Would anybody like to comment on the questions Jonathan has posed so far? I know we did have a com Sorry, guys. comment on the, I think we saw one comment on the ESM list about a um, the need for a uh, heat pump. Um, I forgot that I need to find the electric technology. Okay, electric heat pump technology. So we will take that feedback. We're interested in any detailed feedback you have on the ESM list. Um, and so we do have a comment in the room. Um, if you uh, can introduce yourself so folks know. Matt Singer from DLL. I just wanted to point out in cooling, um, it says air and ground source heat pump. A heat pump, an air source heat pump is a, what they wanted. Okay, so the comment is that an air source heat pump would be the electric right, right. heat pump. For space heating. Yeah. Oh, you're Thank you. Yeah. So, um, as I there's a question on solar. I just wanted to say, as I mentioned earlier, uh, solar is included in the non uh, credit enhanced uh, amount. So, the project size can be up to 2.5 million. The first million is eligible for credit enhancement, and solar is going to not be included in that in that credit enhanced potential of 1 million. Right, so we could have a joint energy efficiency and solar project. We will not pay a credit enhancement on the solar piece um, because there are already, that's prevented in the CPUC's original guidance. There are already other incentives for distributed generation. Okay, we have another uh, question in the room. From, uh, if you can introduce yourself again. Matt, Matt Singer, DLL. Um, for the lighting portion, is there any specific reason for some you're only requiring, you're requiring DLT certification and for some you're requiring a restart? Uh, Dan, do you want to take that one? Sure. The qualifications for the lighting measures um, should be in line with the categories uh, that the, each each program promotes. There, um, typically, the categories do not overlap, so an energy star category won't be found uh, on DLC, and vice versa. So the reason for the difference is purely alignment with the program categories that each one uh, covers. And that was, sorry folks, that was Dan Mellinger from Energy Futures Group, who's con technical consultant to Cape Cod on the commercial pilot development. So thank you all for your great questions. We, uh, we're we going to keep moving, but we'll, if we don't get a chance in, with the Q&A session at the end, we'll definitely record everyone's questions and, and follow up with you after the presentation. I, so Jonathan, I'm going to return to this slide for a second to just clarify a few things. And we knew that um, we understand that this looks confusing, even though we're saying that we've actually simplified the program. Um, so I, I, I get the confusion. So um, what, um, what we're trying to illustrate here is that we want the financing to be available for a large variety of projects. So we're going to make our financing available for any project up to two and a half million dollars. That's a per project cap. There's been some questions as to whether it's a per customer cap or a per project cap. We don't actually know how we would enforce the per customer cap because we're not vetting the customer's identity before the finance company offers the financing. In fact, CAFA will not even necessarily know the customer's identity until after the project has already been submitted to us for enrollment. CAFA is very behind the scenes here, and the deals are worked out between contractors and 
um, finance companies, and we are just creating this hub to bring them together, and we're using a credit enhancement to try to make the financing more attractive. That's all we're doing. So we're not, we're trying to minimize the amount of vetting of projects we have to do up front so we can just enable the market to work. Um, we are putting in some guide rails. So it's a 2.5 per project cap. A million of it is credit enhanced a bull or credit enhanced duh. Um, it can include solar. That will not get a credit enhancement. 70% of what's claim eligible needs to be an energy savings measure. So if the project has no energy savings measures and it's entirely solar, it's, it's not really a project for our program because we are in an energy efficient program. Um, and then 30% of that claim eligible amount could be something else. So as an example project, we could have a $200,000 project. 70,000 of it is lighting and HVAC. 30,000 of that project is painting and bathroom remodeling for a restaurant. That whole 100,000 is claim eligible and we will pay a $10,000 loan loss reserve contribution on that project. The other 100,000 is solar PV. That's not going to get a credit enhancement from the program, but that can be part of the project. We expect, we want to hear from finance companies how they would handle that sort of blended, you know, credit enhanced but non credit enhanced piece, but we understand that customers often want to do one project and not have two separate loans or transactions if they want to include distributed generation, and that's what we're trying to enable. We may or may not have gotten it right, so we look forward to your feedback. I'm going to talk about the credit enhancement a little bit now. So the credit enhancement is going, as was already asked, is going to be set up as a loan loss reserve. We have a current budget of $14 million for that small business loan loss reserve, but we are able to shift more funds into that if there's more demand. We are overfunded in our residential program right now. Um, so if you build it, we will, um, we will shift funds. So um, the, we will open trustee accounts for participating finance entities at a trustee bank. And every time an entity enrolls a loan with us, or a lease or an ESA, we will make a contribution to that entity, that finance company's loan loss reserve account. Um, what we are proposing to do, which is new, is that we are proposing to offer sub-accounts to finance companies who want to be able to sell different parts of their portfolio to different investors. So if there is an investor who buys everything that five, five years or more, there's an investor who buys everything that's to nonprofits or everything that's lighting, we want you to be able to segregate those, those pools. Um, talking about the tiers here, so we are proposing to pay a higher loss reserve contribution on loans, leases, and energy service agreements under 50000 The reason we are proposing to do that is that we know that small projects are very hard to finance because the companies are smaller, they're higher risk, and then you have to take as much time on those small transactions sometimes as the large ones. So we are trying to incentivize finance companies to make their financing available in this very small ticket sphere. We believe there's a lot of demand out there from what we see with the OBS program and also from the small business baseline study that was done by the em and team for this pilot. Um, I'm going to come back to these questions and then it would be a 10% loss reserve on the mid-tier and on tier three it would be a 5% contribution. So in the event of a default, the finance company would be able to recoup 90% of the claim eligible charge off amount. So we want the finance companies to have skin in the game, both on an individual deal and on a portfolio basis. So we would make these payments net of any recovery that the finance company makes. Um, and there is in the appendix of your deck, there is a very detailed example of a claim calculation if uh, folks want to want to see that with more detail. So CAPA is required to do some recapturing of funds as loans pay off so that we can recycle and reuse the funds for future projects. So what we will do is at the end of the fiscal year, we will take a look back at the previous fiscal year. And for loans that have, at least as an ESA, whenever I say loan, I just mean financing instrument. Um, for loans that have paid off, we will recoup our original contribution amount. If a claim has been made during that fiscal year, we will net out that claim amount before we recoup because we, the, the point here is portfolio insurance, so you have to be able to use 
the contributions from the performing loans to offset the risk of the non-performing loans. And if the claim amount is larger than the recapture amount, we won't do any recapture that year. Okay, so I'm going to come back to these questions. Um, these are for finance companies, you know, either now or in written comments or in a, in a phone call with us later. We want to know whether the 20% contribution rate will really help you finance smaller projects. Well, I have, I have a question, Matt Sanger, CLL, again. Um, I'm confused with, you're saying that with the loan loss reserve, we can recoup up to 90% of the full amount. So what are these different contribution rate percentages mean? Okay, great question. So the question is um, differentiating the recoup amount in a claim versus the contribution rate. Yeah. So for every loan that is made, um, for every $50,000 loan that is made, um, we are going to contribute $10,000 to a trustee account for DLL. Okay. And so if DLL makes you know, 10 of those, there'll be $100,000. So the account will build as you enroll more loans in the program. Now let's say one of your $50,000 loans defaults. You can recoup, let's say it defaults the first day and you never even get a payment on it. Mm -hmm. um, and so 90% of that would be 45000 is that right? Mm -hmm. $45,000. Then $45,000 would be what you could recoup. We would, we would ask you to take the $5,000 loss. So we split the losses with you 90-10 so that the finance companies have some stake in every deal. And then we would pay out of your loss reserve account $45,000. You're building your own insurance pool. Mm -hmm. What is the percentage closer than the ones that you're allowed to draw out? So another question is, are there other categories of underserved businesses for which loans, leases, and ESA should receive a higher rate? Um, for example, uh, businesses in a disadvantaged census tract. Um, should, we, should we contribute 20% to those uh, loans? And would that actually help finance companies serve those customers? Um, so we're very interested in your responses to that. And whether or not the 10% versus 5% loss reserve makes a difference. So I, um, there is a hand raised from um, Bob Gunn. Bob, I'm going to unmute you. I'm going to unmute your line. I'm going to try. Hi. Hi there. Can you hear me? This is Bob. Oh, yeah. Hi, Bob. I have a two-part question. One, um, depending on who the bank is, uh, the trustee bank accounts that we're going to be working with, would cannabis businesses be uh, allowed to participate in these energy efficiency uh, funding opportunities? And second, following question is, might we consider them an underserved business considering their lack of other commercial credit availability? Um, so because we're not using federal funds, we don't at this moment see any prohibition on industry, various industries from qualifying. So we don't see if, if, the, if the finance company is comfortable with the loan, um, we don't see any problem with the recipient, the borrower being a cannabis business or a liquor store or a pawn shop or what sometimes those thin industries are excluded from other financing like SBA. Um, so we would be okay with that. Um, as far as I know, we have not received any Comments to the contrary, but um, we are open for comment. Um, in terms of whether we would consider them underserved, um, that is an that is a very interesting question, and I encourage you to uh, to make an argument to us as to why they they should be considered underserved. Perfect. Thank and, you. And get, send me an email with those with the, with your argument. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. I, I will. Thank you so much. Okay. Do we have other comments on the credit enhancement? Um, yes, in the room, if you can introduce yourself. Hi, Robert Wiggler from the Energy Commission. Um, so I, I noticed that you have demand response as one of the programs that you're um, proposing to finance. Seems like it might be an inherently more risky program than other types of um, uh, measures or programs. Uh, what is your, what sort of demand response program are you considering? So, so the question is, um, we have demand response as a measure that we would consider eligible. We would consider demand response measures eligible for the program and that there's more risk. Do you, I'm assuming you mean more risk from a savings potential or more risk for the financial company? Maybe both. Okay. Yeah. So I think, the, um, I think in terms of the risk, 
um, to the finance company as to whether savings would be there. I think that really depends on how the deal is structured and if it's structured as a service agreement where payments are based on savings versus a loan or a lease, I think we would allow the finance company to make and take that risk. In terms of what measures we would consider eligible for the program, um, I believe that we, so there, I think there's two ways that a, a demand response measure would qualify. One would be, so, sorry for those of you on the line uh, dealing with the flipping, um, one would be if the professional consultants um, through their pathway, Here we go. Um, if the professional consultant through their pathway was able to certify, if, a, if an engineer or a certified energy manager was able to say, in this context, this demand response measure will save energy, or if it was part of a utility uh, or third party implemented program, okay. then we would consider it to be qualified. You know, if the utilities blessed it, um, you know, or their program implementers got it passed, then we would want to be that finance, we would want to be financing for it. Okay. Um, and it is more it is more complicated than just a measure that we can put on the deemed list, absolutely. So I guess well, Can you introduce yourself, please? Oh yeah, I'm Sasha Cole, I'm Officer Rapecar Advocate, which is part of the Public Utilities Commission. And uh sometimes I don't get to see how how these things work out on the business side, so I kind of have a question because you keep talking about uh the kind of size of the loan loss reserve. And I guess that translates for these people into lower interest rates. That's uh so the mechanism, and then that translates into lower financing costs for projects. And I'm trying to figure out if anyone just very quickly can hear this and know sort of what's the size of that. Yeah, yeah. So I think the question is, how does the loss reserve actually translate into benefit to the to the to the end user, to the borrower, and then to more projects, and then to more projects. Well, you know, our interest in government is right more projects with less risk to ratepayers and. Yeah. Getting more for the money we can spend. So I will say that in the real program, on the residential program, we have seen the interest, um, we have seen the loss reserve contribute to four types of benefits for borrowers. And those have been lower rates, longer terms, which means that folks can stretch their payments out um, and make those payments affordable, higher amounts available to borrow, and broader underwriting criteria. So better rates if your FICO score is lower, or even getting a loan if your FICO score is lower. We're interested to see in the commercial financing world what the uh, loss reserve will enable finance companies to do. I think for some, it will be able to affect their rates. For others, based on their sources of capital, it will not. We've heard things like lower um, reserves required of contractors, who sometimes have to put up a reserve as well in order to borrow. We've heard uh, enabling companies that might have a um, might not have the full length of their lease left. That if their let's say their lease is only five years, but the equipment they want to um, pay has a 10-year life cycle, that the finance company might be able to accept a shorter lease. I, I will pause for a moment to see if there are any finance companies who want to um, who want to talk about what types not not a commitment of any sort, but just how a loss reserve can help um, make financing more attractive. And this question, I'll just note, is from the Office of Ratepayer Advocates who oversee the funds for the program inside the, the CPUC. We don't oversee it, but we're kind of the watchdog, yeah. The watchdog, that's a good, who's our hand? Harry Williams. Um, do you want to unmute him? Hi, Harry, I've unmuted you. Would you like to comment? I'm going to unmute uh, Dennis Quinn from uh, Jewel Asset. Great. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so we're, uh, we kind of operate in ESCO and, and, and operate uh, using a variety of capital sources. And the, the comment I would have um, well, more translates to being able to get more customers and more meeting small businesses involved with programs such as this, where um, we are under a pay for performance. So our, our our sense is a payment performance approach is actually going to be a benefit to the rate payers and the fact that you're actually going to have the rate payers be paying for what they receive and being access to capital through a program such as this will be important in being able to um, in, in, to incorporate more customers into that program it's, it's still a little bit uncertain 
um, to the extent the paper performance might mix with an OBF, with a zero and existing zero interest, or what the cost of that might be. In this particular case, uh, this allows for a cost competitive, uh, and I'm not going to speak to the rate differential that a, that a lender might or a capital provider might make, but it certainly provides access to capital so that paper performance approaches can actually, and, and, and programs can actually, uh, you know, roll out in, into the upcoming solicitations. But input, thank, thanks, I appreciate it, Miriam. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to move on to um, talk a little bit about finance companies, and we'll, we'll come back to have more discussion at the end, and I really appreciate the discussion, everyone. So what I want to talk about now is the, the important role that the finance company performs in our small business program, and I've broken this role into about eight different mini roles just so we can get an appreciation of the complexity of the value chain in commercial financing. So first, there's the market representation. So this is the uh, kind of name of, this is the name that we're going to put out there is associated with our program that customers will see that they should go apply for financing from this company. Um, so this entity will be associated with a state program. Then there's the entity that actually does the underwriting and needs to follow our program guidelines. Um, then there's the entity that originates, and when we say originate here, we mean you know, executes the legal contract and the loan documents. Then there's the entity that actually does the disbursement of funds to the contractor. And then there's the entity that does what we call loan submittal. And so this entity is, is providing us data on the loan, lease or ESA, so we can enroll it in the program and fund that lost reserve. CAFA doesn't actually get any um, loan or lease documents. We just get some data related to it that the lender provides us. Then there's the servicing entity, which is going to send out you know, billing and do the receive payment. There's the entity that needs to do monthly reporting, which is supplying CAFA with regular information about loan performance. There's a lot of interest in this program um, around how energy efficiency loans perform. And one of our goals and directives from the Public Utility Commission is to make public anonymously information about how energy efficiency loans are doing. So there is a monthly reporting function. And then there's what we call the loss, loan loss reserve account representative, which is the entity that would have the name on the trustee accounts and be uh, responsible for filing a claim or be allowed to file a claim in the event of a default. Now, in some cases, like a commercial bank, the bank might do all eight of those functions that I just mentioned. But what we have seen in the energy efficiency financing world is that often there'll be an entity that has some capital that will then hire somebody else to originate service um, and may or may not fund, uh, may buy and purchase the loans back later. Or there are many, many different models. Um, so what we want to be able to do, and this is kind of new in our program design from, from what you've seen before, we want, to be we want to enable a wide variety of models to participate in our program. And so what we're proposing is kind of a flexible participation strategy for finance companies where two entities would be able to join together and apply as a primary and affiliate applicant if they wanted. Um, the primary applicant would be the one that does the loan submittal to us, but then the applicant would tell us, okay, who's going to do the origination, who's going to service, who's going to report. And it could all be the same entity, but there'd be the flexibility to have it be split. And then a third party could be designated to be the marketing representative because we know some of the entities that participate with us do white label, who are interested in participating with us, do white label products and don't want their own name on it but want to put the name of whoever they're originating for on it. So um, all of our applicants are going to need to meet some key requirements like telling us, okay, here's the products that we're going to offer or set of products. Here's the benefits that borrowers can expect based on that loan loss deserve contribution, and everyone will need to be properly licensed to engage in the, the particular business activities that they're doing. So uh, we are defining a financial institution for purposes of the program as a federally insured depository, CDFI, or a financial development corporation. So entities that are less regulated or not regulated will need to maintain some additional, meet some additional requirements to participate. And what we want to make sure is that the entities that are underwriting, originating, and servicing have a certain amount of net worth so that we know they're going to be around in the program, you know, in, in the 
you know, fourth, fifth, sixth, tenth year, and also um, have the demonstration of key personnel and the qualifications to perform those tasks. We are proposing a requirement for originator and just demonstrating at least 10 million in committed capital, whether that's a bank line of credit or, or a letter from another investor, and, and we're interested to know whether that is a reasonable requirement. So some questions for which we are seeking feedback on this topic are, um, what level of information can finance companies provide to case on their underwriting so that we can make sure that you have sound underwriting, but we also understand there's proprietary things out there. Uh, for the originator role, what, other than the committed capital, what other demonstrations of experience and competence should CAFA require? Should we, should we ask for a certain number of loans closed or amount of financing closed to date or years in business? And for the servicer role, how can we ensure that applicants are going to give high customer service? Um, is it reasonable for um, CAFA to require that applicants disclose the funders of their financing if, if, it's, if they're not their own source of capital? And what other demonstrations of confidence should we look for? Um, is there anyone who wants to speak to that right now? If so, please raise your hand and I will unmute you. Okay, then I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about the financial product. So as I mentioned, uh, loans, leases, and energy service agreements, we want to be able to support all three in our program. Uh, loans are really straightforward, except that um, these need to be fully amortizing loans, not lines of credit or open-ended lines. The real difference in our definition here is between a lease and an energy service agreement. And we are uh, really defining a lease as something that has fixed payments regardless of what happens with the energy usage, whereas the energy service agreement is going to relate payments based on savings. So what we're proposing is to define an energy service agreement as an instrument where payments are based at, at least 75% of that monthly payment is based on energy savings. So we're trying to distinguish between a product where everyone is incentivized to save energy, which is what happens in the structure of the service agreement, versus the lease where the payment happens regardless of whether savings are there. Now, we are very interested in your feedback on this. We understand there are many, many different models of ESAs out there. Um, and so we're, we're looking to make sure that our um, definition incorpor incorporates what's out there in the market, but we also really do want to draw a line between a fixed required monthly payment and one that is actually tied to savings realized because we think there's a structural difference. In terms of the product requirements, we're trying to be pretty broad here. Uh, we are not proposing to cap interest rates in the small business program. We do cap them on the residential side from a consumer protection standpoint, but we understand that small, business, uh, have, small businesses have all sorts of different credit risks, and we want to encourage participation from finance companies who are serving some of the more, um, some of the borrowers who can't get credit elsewhere because they might be high credit risk. What we are asking for is disclosure of either um, lease principal and um, interest and fees or an APR. Um, we're interested to know what the lease companies think of that. We know that lease companies typically don't do that type of disclosure. Um, so we're looking for something that can meet your needs but also is fair and transparent to a borrower who's participating in a government-backed program. So please help us with some suggestions there. Um, no restriction on term length. We will maintain that credit enhancement for 10 years, so a loan will remain claim eligible for 10 years from when it's enrolled. Um, generally, we don't want to do refinances because we want new projects. We don't want to just refinance something that would have happened without this program, but we are going to make an exception if the, project is, if the loan is enrolled within 90 days of project completion. And that's to enable down payment loans or some sort of quasi progress payment or bridge financing. Um, fees have to be reasonable and in line with industry standards. Uh, we're not requiring progress payments to contractors. We know that they really appreciate it. Um, and in terms of collateral, we are not requiring any collateral on claim eligible that tier one under 50,000. For claim eligible amounts over 50,000, we do think that the finance company should take a security interest so that the ratepayer dollars are that backed up and not the first on the line. Uh, but we're interested in your thoughts on that. 
Um, we don't want the security to be real property um, with the exception of a UCC1 fixture filing. So some questions that we're interested in on the finance side are what collateral requirements should there be for financing greater than 50,000? Is it enough for CAFA to require a security interest or should the regulations be more specific? On the energy service agreement, does our proposed definition work for the industry? And is the requirement that 75% of the monthly payments be based on savings, is that appropriate to distinguish an ESA from a lease? And if not, what is? And then the question about lease disclosure of APR. Is there anyone who wishes to respond to our questions? Um, Adler, I'm going to unmute your line. If you can introduce yourself, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Um, so I, I actually had raised my hand with regard to the, a pre, the previous uh, slide where you asked for some feedback. Oh, no and problem. Can you introduce yourself? I'm sorry? Can you introduce your name and organization? Oh, apologies. Uh, my name is Adler Prioli. I'm Director of Clean Energy at Reinvestment Fund. We're a large community development finance institution that has been in providing lending for clean energy projects since 1993 and been talking with Jonathan and Miriam. Uh, we like what you're doing and uh, so pleased to be here. Um, but my, my suggestion on the previous slide, I think you were asking about what particular is it quality, level of information can com finance companies provide. Um, I've, I think um, it, it could be helpful just for their um, understanding the background of some of these firms to ask them to disclose kind of what's the, the number of loans they've made and the loan volume, just to understand the ratio of activity to their overall production. I think um, you know a shop that does $500,000 in loans may seem small, but actually you know have done a, a number of consumer loans in the amount of 1,000 or 5,000. And so the volume relative, to, the activity relative to their volume is actually substantive. So that's just a suggestion on maybe disclosure for understanding qualifications. And then second, I think disclosing whether entities are rated or have some other kind of recognized, you know, systematic institution designation uh, could be helpful. Sorry, can you repeat that second one? Yeah, at, um, asking entities to sort of just to understand uh, capacity, asking them to disclose, um, provide disclosures about whether they have specifically recognized designations. So for example, um, reinvestment fund where I work, we're actually rated by S&P and ARIES, which rates nonprofits. And I imagine that that is not necessarily a criteria you want to require of all of your financial partners, but is a, as a disclosure is helpful for assessing capacity. Yeah, thank you. Those are both excellent. Uh, excellent suggestions to consider not just the total um, dollar amount closed, but the actual ongoing activity as well as other designations that can be sort of a proxy for um, a hard vetting of the financial institution. So thank you. Sure. sure. And then if I just have one last comment about underwriting, um, I think, you know, you could, I, I think, of, uh, asking about loan to value requirements. And um, I, I imagine there might be some questions around uh, balance sheet requirements, uh, various ratios, which may be debt to assets. I don't necessarily know that you want to require that, but you know, asking firms to disclose kind of how they think about those ratios when they're underwriting and whether they have specific um, you know, hard lines with respect to what those should be. So thank you. Okay, no, thank you for the comment. Um, and actually, we're going to move on to um, customer eligibility and talk about some of that underwriting now. Um, before I do that, I do want to address a comment I, I called in that said, um, is there a prepayment penalty? Oh, I see Jonathan's address is in writing, but is there a prepay pe prepayment penalty? And can you confirm if progress payments are provided to contractors? So, the, so both of those determinations, prepayment penalties for borrowers and progress payments to contractors, would be the decision of the finance company. And what we're hoping to do is attract a bunch of different finance companies that offer different products, that serve different market sizes, that can work for different kinds of contractors and borrowers, so that there would be 
sort of a, a variety and a pick. Um, what we've seen on the residential side is that the finance companies have not so far um, had any prepayment penalties and the borrowers love it. Um, in terms of the progress payments, that would again be the, uh, up to the finance company who would probably want to look at the particular contractor and underwrite them. What we are trying to do is enable something like a progress payment by allowing that refinance so that some funds could be advanced and then taken out when the loan is actually closed. Okay, in terms of the customers, who are we, who are these customers who are going to come and um, save energy and through this program? So the um, the program is targeting small, in terms of SBA size, um, nonprofits or uh, small businesses. So government entities are not eligible for this program. They will be eligible for our non-residential program, which will roll out subsequently. Um, affordable multifamily buildings will also have their own pilot, and there's some details about those in your uh, appendix. We want to be open to um, owners or tenants. And then we are proposing some universal credit standards here of no bankruptcies, judgments, or liens within the last five years. And um, we want to know what you think about that. If there are um, especially CDFIs that might work with companies that have had bankruptcies, we don't want to um, interfere with that. Now, in terms of specific credit standards, we're really trying to strike, strike a balance here of allowing finance companies to follow their own underwriting standards with the need to have some guide rails in place to protect the rate payer funds. So we want to keep this simple, but yet have guide rails that folks can follow. So again, we're interested in your feedback as to how we did. Um, so for the small tiers, for the 50,000 and under, the only, um, we're only requiring two things. One is that they've been in business for at least a year. And the other is that the underwriter uh, must conduct a credit check using some sort of standard industry scoring system. We're not even requiring what that credit minimum is. We're just saying you as the lender or lease provider need to look at, at, how, at what their credit history is. And that's because the amount of ratepayer dollars per loan is pretty small. On the tier twos from 50 to 350, we're asking for that credit check. And then we're asking for one other thing, we're asking for either a check for positive operating profit, which will take EBIT, EBITDA, or taxable, uh, positive taxable income. We know that some uh, companies don't look at income statements um, for, for financing amounts under 250 or 350,000. So then we're saying, okay, then we at least want to know that the customer is in business for five years or that they've provided a personal guarantee. So there's kind of a, a pick from that menu there. And then tier three, we're asking for the credit check. We are asking for the positive operating profit because we think for over 350,000, everyone's looking at an income statement. So we don't think that's a, a burden. And then we're looking for either one of the debt service coverage ratio is greater than 1.15. So you've done some sort of balance sheet check or cash flow analysis, or that you're doing an ESA and the project is projected to be cash flow positive so that we think the customer will be able to repay. So questions for the finance companies on this one. Um, the, so the first is, how familiar are you with the SBA industry size requirements? We know that you know, banks and small business lenders who use the SBA programs are very familiar, but for the more specialty lenders working in the energy efficiency or clean energy space, is this easy for you to meet these requirements, or is this a whole new learning curve? Um, so that's a question there. On the credit side, um, question about our preclusion of bankruptcies, judgments, and liens. Is that, is, does that preclude lending that you want to allow? Should we actually require a specific minimum credit score from a standard um, agency? Or is it enough to require that we, is it enough to require that you've done a, a check of some sort? And then are the underwriting requirements flexible and streamlined enough to fit with your existing operations? And will they support lending to businesses and nonprofits that might not access traditional credit? And are they strict enough for the ratepayer funds? So I want to see who wants to comment on this. Please raise your hand. Um, Adler, I'm going to unmute you again. Hi, thanks. 
Um, just a, a few comments on the previous slide. So for the debt service coverage ratio, I would actually, um, and, and just for context for everyone, uh, we tend to work on much smaller opportunities that are oftentimes a little bit more challenged finding commercial financing. And so in tier three debt service coverage ratio for 1.15, I actually think we've, we've done things down to 1.1 and I would actually, I'd actually, you know, propose some thinking about debt service coverage ratio of 1.10 or an average of 1.10. And that's, and that's because for smaller ESA projects, oftentimes they have an escalator and it may start off on the low end, but uh, because the revenues are increasing and inflation adjusted, the project's economics actually strengthen over time. So um, in underwriting, that's something that we look at and it's just, it's something to think about. So I, I'd be- And Adler, are you doing those on a, for like a traditional loan or, or are you, is it, that a traditional is, loan structure? So we've we've done ESAs and we look, look at the debt service coverage ratio. Um, so we've we've done that for sort of the real estate as well as for energy lending at that sort of one point one, uh, assuming that it's a small project and we can structure it appropriately. And then okay, so the so the ESA out. exemption here would work. Um. I may have missed that in the presentation. What do you mean by the exemption? Your goal is to eat. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. okay, right. Yeah, that's, that's okay, great. Okay, yeah. I'm going to move along to, thank you. I'm going to move along to the secondary market. Um, and this is basically that we want to enable our, we want to make sure that our financing can enable the sale and transfer, or excuse me, that our program can enable the sale and transfer of enrolled financing. Our goal is to bring more capital into the energy efficiency space, so we want to make sure we are not designing the program in a way that can prohibit those transactions. So we're, we are going to ask for, um, when, when, when loans are, or leases are sold, we do need to maintain some ongoing program responsibility. We need to still get reports. We need to know who's in charge of that um, loan loss reserve account, and we need to know, um, we need to uh, make sure that the customer is still going to have good servicing. So we are working out um, what that transfer of responsibility from entities might look like, but we are also, as I mentioned earlier, proposing to open up to three sub-accounts for finance companies that want to group their um, enrolled loans, leases, or ESAs by specific investor. Okay, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, program participation and how the various uh, players get involved. Um, in this slide, you can see there are four different swim lanes for the, uh, the different uh, participants. And um, we are in a session with a developer to build a web-based portal for entering a loan and project info for contractors and finance companies to uh, enter this info into our uh, program. So this slide shows a, a, a high view timeline, uh, starting with the customer choosing a, a lender and contractor from those that are participating in the program, and then the option for the finance company then to uh, pre-approve credit, and then uh, the contractor would enter into the portal and enter uh, the scope of work uh, into the, on the project. And if, uh, if, if necessary, the professional consultant, the energy manager or engineer would then certify estimated energy savings. So at that stage, CAFA has what we need to uh, make an initial pre-approval for the project and then uh, estimate a loan loss reserve amount. <clears throat> and then the lender would receive notification of the, of the project and at that point, if they haven't done the credit check already, would do the credit check and approve the project. And then installation starts. Once it's done, the contractor certifies completion and finalizes the project data. And uh, the customer signs off on the project that they're satisfied. And, uh, and at that point, then the finance company will um, add loan data and submit the project data within 90 days and have an option to fund at that point. And then CAFA would consider the loan enrolled and we would fund the loan loss reserve. <clears throat> okay, so that brings us to the end of our. Um, Did you want to see if there are comments on that, questions on that? Oh, 
Did anyone have any uh, questions or comments on this uh, timeline slide? Oh, go ahead. Robert Ridgely, Energy Commission again. So is there any final um, uh, certification or confirmation of energy savings? The, the checks, like I said, oh, okay, so we have the back end checks for our um, for our quality assurance, and then uh, the Public Utilities Commission is going to be doing the uh, uh, measurement uh, EM and B on the back end, uh, verifying uh, measure energy savings for the program. Is that only for the ESA thing? I was confused between that and the loan, and what's Well, this is for different uh, types of. Oh, sorry. But... Okay, so there, so there, we have two questions right now. One is about verification of energy savings, and the other is whether that verification of savings would be different for a loan versus an energy savings agreement. Mm -hmm. So, so um, in terms of what what the actual savings from the pilot will be, that will be determined in two ways. For projects that have a utility rebate or incentive, the utility will calculate the savings like they do with all of their rebate and incentive programs. We're expecting to have a lot of non-rebated projects or finance-only projects because we think that the pathways that we have laid out are actually going to be faster and easier for a contractor who would normally have to go through the utility's custom uh, programs, we've heard that those programs take a very, very long time to get approval. And what happens is that customers get frustrated and they just want the savings, so then they install something that's less efficient because they don't want to wait for the incentive. And so what we're trying to do is enable custom projects to come through our um, professional certification path where a CEM or PE could basically certify that something is going to save energy and then we would, um, the, the project could just be installed in our program with no incentive. And again, that's that balance of less ratepayer money requiring less upfront stringency. And um, now, what will the end result of those savings be? Um, the commission right now, I believe in the last few weeks, they have um, issued a, a pre-solicitation draft for it. There will be an RFP going out for an evaluator who will evaluate the pilot in addition to several other, you know, PUC uh, uh, programs, and um, so that evaluator will determine what are the what are the savings that can be claimed by the utilities um, for these pilots, and then we'll see. We'll see as our kind of broad approach resulted in a portfolio of savings or not. You know, I think one of the um, influences on us is that sometimes even the very very strict requirement programs aren't yielding the savings that folks want to see and, and aren't um, achieving the kind of um, cost efficiency or meeting that total cost ratio that, um, that is desired. So we are, um, you know, so we're proposing to be more streamlined and those energy checks will happen on the back end. So it's not borne by the customer. Okay, so the question is uh, whether the energy check is borne by the customer. Um, the, the calculation of energy savings for the pilots overall will be, um, will be borne by the program or borne by the, the, um, the hiring of an evaluator to, um, fr or from the commission, I guess. I'm not sure exactly what budget lines to evaluate the program. We like to call it the rate payers. Uh -huh. It comes out of your, your utility bill, that money. Yeah. Thank you, Sasha. Um, in terms of on the energy service agreement side, in terms of if a customer were to enter into an energy service agreement with a contractor and a finance company, that would be the responsibility of the uh, finance company and the contractor to say to the customer, here are your projected savings. Um, now, and that's why our definition of that energy savings agreement is so important. We don't want to define an energy savings agreement as something where the contractor says the savings are going to be there and then they're not. So that's why we want we, we want a definition of an energy savings agreement where the payments are actually tied to savings. Now payments can be fixed monthly, but they need to be reconciled to actual savings so that customers pay for what they're really getting in terms of efficiency and not just what the contractor installed and left there. Um, we will we're also open to the idea of savings guarantees. You know, and I, I think we want to get some some feedback as to whether that would. Um, also help, uh, could be an alternate definition of, of an energy savings agreement is maybe just an instrument with a guarantee. 
So uh, we have a question from the room um, from Chris Terrell saying, when do contractors actually get paid in this program, progress payments, final payment, et cetera? And that's uh, in between uh, the lender and the contractor. We are the hub of energy efficiency financing, so we are uh, bringing uh, different parties together. But our assumption with this program uh, is that uh, there's going to be discussion outside of our program between uh, the customer and the contractor, the contractor and the lender, and these agreements are going to be reached. And we're just uh, facilitating that through, uh, through our credit enhancement and our, and our program. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to the last slide here. And then after you show how to give feedback, maybe we'll read some of these questions out loud. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we would love to hear from you all. You, you all have been getting a, a bunch of great uh, great comments and questions. And as I said, we'll be following up on those uh, after if we don't get to them now. But uh, there's contact information for us here in the presentation. You can also be found on our website at thechief.com. So definitely we'd love to hear from you and further discuss uh, our program approach. Okay, so did you have any particular questions you wanted to get into? Let's see. So if anybody wants to comment and has not, now's a great time to raise your hand. Um, I'm going to go through. Um, so there was a comment uh, from Jeff about Jeff Guild about um, review of project costs for eligibility is not viable. And I think this was a comment maybe about the breakdown between energy savings and non-energy. And, and Jeff, if you if, if you want to speak, I invite you to raise your hand and I'll unmute you if, if you want to talk to that a little bit more. That, that seems like a good discussion. Another question is, what if your small business client is about four months short of the two-year business requirement, but the project will return an immediate 7,000 month saving? So I think the answer to that question, what we've proposed, so the two-year business requirement, I think, was a, let's go here. Um, the um, the two-year business requirement um, could be overridden if it's a tier two project, if the customer provided a personal guarantee along with a credit check. Um, if, that, if, if you don't think that's reasonable and you think there should be like an ESA exemption on the on the tier two project, then um, please please submit that to us in a comment because we'd be interested um, to hear your thoughts. I had one I wanted to answer. Actually, this is a few related questions. Uh, one of them is, when is the non-residential public agency pilot going to come out? So um, this pilot that we've outlined here is all off the utility bill. We are uh, planning on doing an on-bill repayment pilot as well. That's going to plan for the beginning of uh, for 2019. And the under repayment is going to be uh, a requirement for uh, the large non-residential and uh, government uh, government agency financing pilot. Um, we had a question here about sort of how it works. Um, you know, do the finance entities and the contractors partner together? And so what we're we're expecting is um, that that we basically will create this this hub with our platform our Go Green financing platform, and we will list all the finance companies and their offerings and all the contractors and their offerings. And then um, customers will either start by applying for credit or more likely find a contractor, and then the contractor will have several different finance companies to offer financing. We imagine that finance companies and contractors will sort of develop relationships and work together, which is what happens all the time right now outside of our hub, except that we will hopefully through our credit enhancement and our and our program be able to offer better rates. So we um, we will help facilitate the deal flow, but the actual matchmaking of contractor and finance company won't take place through our platform. It'll take place in the real world, you know, through conversations, and then we'll ask both parties to just supply us some data so we can enroll the financing in the program. We have a hand raised, uh, Jeff Gill. Oh. oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I invited him to. Do you want to unmute him? Um, all right, Jeff, you're on the line. Yeah, thanks. So um, uh, the example you gave for breaking down kind of the non-qualified costs, I think it was Sorry, like, you know, uh, bathrooms. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you just introduce your uh, background, what company you're from? Yeah, I'm I'm Jeff Guild. I'm with Anovi. Um, we, do, we develop projects, we implement projects, and we also implement programs. So kind of hard to classify one one signal thing, but our target car customers are typically um, 
larger cut, uh, larger commercial, some institutional um, and uh, public agencies as well as private uh, commercial real estate also. So kind of a wide variety. Our, um, we do some lighting projects. We do a lot of mechanical projects, a lot of things that involve retro commissioning and, and controls upgrades. So sometimes these uh, the lines get blurred between what um, is you know strictly energy efficiency and what is a what is a general upgrade to a facility. So huh. your your example, you know, you know, putting in new efficient equipment, but also trying to paint the bathrooms and whatever else. That's kind of a clear cut example. Um, but you know, oftentimes we'll do a project, and in order to affect energy savings through controls measures, we need to upgrade the controls. And then people start to question, well, what is actually the, the what's the measure? Where does, where does the energy savings start and the, uh, the, the whatever non-energy benefits the customer might be getting from the, the upgrade? Um, so it just kind of, it it's in the eye of the beholder frequently. Um, and that beholder isn't always benevolent. So I guess just how is that, you know, how is that supposed to work in practice where it's not, there isn't a bright line between right. what you would an energy efficiency measure and what's not? So I think our attempt to deal with that is to say that anything that's legally and practically required as part of the installation would count towards that 70% requirement of claim eligible finance amount. So if I understood your example correctly, and in order to put in the lighting that, you, that, you, that the customer wants to put in that's efficient, you also have to go ahead and update all of those controls. We would consider the controls a practical measure and we would count those controls as, as energy saving measure. Okay. So I think, I think the key here is going to be how we define legal and practical in our regulation. And so, um, I, I invite you, you know, when, in our next workshop, when we actually have that that text, or even beforehand, I invite you to weigh in because we we understand that, and um, the commission has given us flexibility on that one. Um, in order to, we know that you know when you start going into a building, you discover other things that you have to do. You find knob and tube wiring, or I don't know, you find things that you have to take out or things that you have to add. And we would consider that if it's necessary for the installation, we would consider that um, part of that 70% cost. And then that, we would ask. Uh, that that answers that. Yeah, right. that, that, that sounds good. Um, it sounds a little bit more broad. I think what we're used to dealing with is in the context of um, qualified project costs when a customer is eligible for an incentive. And that incentive is capped at the, at the eligible project cost, and then it turns into. It can, it can turn into kind of a, you know, a very nuanced and, and uh, varied interpretation of what is a qualified cost. So just if it's it, you know, what you describe sounds good. Um, and so I guess I would just caution about it not being clear. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for that comment. Um, Harry, oh, no, that was Harry. Oh, Harry had a hand earlier. Oh, Harry had a hand earlier. Okay. Um, Harry, we're going to unmute you. Uh, please introduce yourself. Harry, you may have self-muted as well. Okay, Harry, I'm sorry. We can't seem to unmute your line. If you want to type your question in or your comment in, we will read it out loud. Um, okay, I'm sorry that we that we can't get um, I'm sorry that we can't get Harry's question or comment. So it is 11:30. I appreciate everybody um, who joined us in person and on the phone. Um, I will. I want to show one more time on the screen. Just just going through the presentation. Right oh yeah, yeah. Here's the review. <laughs> um, I just want to show one more time on the screen. Um, we've got all the questions at the end on um, how to give us feedback. There'll be a survey coming to you after this webinar that'll include our questions. You don't have to answer all of them, just answer the ones that are relevant to you um, or, or answer whatever you want. If we didn't ask something that you want to 
tell us. Um, we would love to hear from you, and we hope you will join us again later this summer when we will hopefully have regulations to put in front of you. So thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Well done. Yeah. Presented really well. Oh. Go back to PC and give the for 20 minutes. Go ahead. I'll go back to you.